Istama up against Rishi Sunak, although we heard just then from Jonathan Ashworth, shadow cabinet minister, that they'll go one after the other and there will be a toss up with a coin uh, as to see, well, who is the biggest? No, I'm not going to say that. Who will go first uh, tonight? They'll take questions from uh, an audience. Uh, how exciting is that? We're delighted now to be joined by a man whose last time was on this show said, well, you haven't said happy birthday, but I did in the end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Lord, Ed, well, not Mr. Lord Ed Vasey. Edward, how are you? Very well, Jeremy. Um, where are you? You look like you're in a sort of, I don't know, one of those places in America where, where you're sort of, it's a penitentiary. There's a lot of, oh, what is that behind? It's the neighbours staring in. Oh. oh, you have neighbours. I don't get to see yeah. mine. Uh, Ed, they, uh, well, always, they always look, they look through the windows. They see everything we're up to. Yes. Uh, saw you there with the cheeky glass. Is that water or gin and tonic? Be honest, please. It's a gin and tonic. I love your honesty. Um, you know what my first uh, question to you is going to be, and I want you to approach it in the You know same why way. it's a gin and tonic, don't you? Why? Because it's six o'clock in France. Good man. There's always a time in the world <laughs> that you can have a drink. Um, Ed, I know you're a lord now. Um, it, it was a, it was the payoff. Hard to believe. Hard, Hard to believe. To believe. Uh, just a political payoff for not having made it to the cabinet. But I ask yeah. you this. Um, what did you miss out on? as a child. I mean, poor Rishi, he, he missed out on Sky Television. What, what did you miss out on, Lord Ed Vasey? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I tell you, Jeremy, when I was growing up, yeah. only three TV channels anyway. Yeah. BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, that was it. Yeah. Got home, watched Grange Hill, had my tea. Yeah. Uh, never missed out, never wanted for anything, Jeremy. We were happy kids. Happy we were happy kids. kids. Dirty, unwashed and cold, but played we were in, happy. Played in street, played in street with a football, didn't need anything else. Against garage door till she said, come in tea time, put same trousers on, go back to school. <laughs> um, listen, as an experience... I honestly can't think I had a kind of totally normal middle class upbringing in yes, West London. Uh, yes. I barely moved. I'm a medieval peasant. I live about one mile away from where I was brought up. Uh, and I never really felt I wanted for anything. I mean, you know, if I wanted to go all Sunak, I'd say... We didn't have many holidays abroad. Do you? Uh, do, I know you were a former Conservative culture minister, not Secretary of State. But if you were standing now, if you were fighting your old constituency, when you heard that, be honest with me, Lord Ed Vasey, your head would be in your hands, wouldn't it? I mean, the D-Day thing's bad enough. Let's upset all the veterans. And now let's completely hack off anybody north of Watford Gap who's really struggling. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, yes. When you put it like that, it's quite difficult. There is a defence. I mean, the, the point he's making, which is a fair point. You know, he Rishi Sunak grew up in a middle class household. And we were obsessed by class in this country anyway. But, you know, his parents, for want of a better phrase, were small business people. Uh, you know, I think his parents both together ran the pharmacy. Uh, and they send him to a very, very expensive school. I mean, that Winchester is very expensive because it's boarding as well as being a private school. Uh, so there's no doubt at all that they would have cut out fringe stuff. Now, obviously, when you say something like we didn't have Sky, it sounds mildly absurd. But the point he's obviously making is that, uh, you know, he would have been a teenager saying, I want to watch the football. Why can't we have Sky? And his parents would have said, look, we have a very tight budget. And the reason we have a tight budget is because we save every penny we can to make sure you go to a great school. But obviously, it sounds clunky and it sounds bad. But you can see, I will defend him, you can see the point he is making. Uh, John and Harrogate puts it another well, Yeah, but John, John, John and Harrogate puts it another way. Uh, Jez, I miss uh, not having electricity, mains, water, bathroom and outside toilet when I was young, but working for 60 years now, I'm reasonably OK. I voted Conservative all my life with one exception, UKIP in the European Parliament. However, I can never vote for the Tories again. I will vote reform. John and Harrogate. Ed? That's the problem of what that Rishi, Rishi Sunak has of got. Rishi Sid. No, but that's the yeah, problem look, that Rishi not, and the Tories uh... have got. That's what. And if you make gaffes and make yourself completely, if you like, just not relatable, when your policies and 14 years of fatigue have kicked in. I mean, I find it astonishing, Ed, that the Labour Party is so far ahead in the polls and haven't said anything yet. <laughs> This is one of those interviews where I feel like a listener straight view. I'm just so enjoying it. What? I don't really want to interrupt you. <laughs> I think it's just be you, you and the listeners sounding off as though you're in the pub. This is great entertainment. I've got to say, look, I can't defend it. I mean, it does sound clunky. It does sound 
uh, out of touch. I'm trying to think, you know, I'm trying to think of the parallels with David Cameron because he obviously got it in the neck and he did come from a very privileged uh, background, but, and he uh, he may once or twice have said the old clunky thing about how um, it's your word of the day clunky. I mean, isn't do you it? remember? Do you remember? I mean, we, you and I are old enough. Your listeners won't be because you skew young because you're so hip and trendy. But um, Douglas Heard, yes. Douglas Heard, an old Etonian, funny enough, who represented David Cameron's seat in Parliament was Margaret Thatcher's Home Secretary when he ran for the leadership against John Major. He was pilloried, of course, because he said he came from peasant farming stock. Uh, I think his dad was a sort of Clarkson-like gentleman farmer. Probably a more peasant competent. farming yeah. stock. And I've come to Parliament's then. I've <laughs> well, crossed the moat. And one has this, I've crossed uh, the moat. It, it is quite entertaining. I mean, British politics is obviously very entertaining as a spectator sport. And one does have this kind of every election. And Cameron had it in spades, obviously, as, as an old Etonian prime minister, uh, where we basically try and take down our elders and betters. Uh, we take them down a peg or two. Uh, we constantly cross-examine them. Uh, you know, when you're prime minister, you know, Cameron had to let people into his house and watch him cook the roast chicken and try and pretend. He well, that's the tried first to mistake, him. David. I, I did cooking. What's <laughs> he the tried to pretend. He, do you remember he tried to pretend he was normal when he yeah. on holiday? He always used to do the photo shoot on holiday. He was always wearing black leather office shoes with a hoodie. <laughs> Ridiculous. And I think just basically politicians would, would be better off just saying, look, we're clearly weird. I mean, yes. we wouldn't be doing this job if we weren't weird. So please leave me alone. I'm a weirdo. Do you, brilliant, <laughs> do you on a serious note, when you see the debacle, I mean, I watched Starmer arrive. I said this to, to Jonathan Ashworth as well. I saw Starmer arrive in Grimsby, quite well they picked Grimsby, they did. And he's like that. And he yeah. literally, he looks like he's had his whole face Botox because he's the <laughs> Ming vase policy is, I'm not going to say anything in case I, I drop the ball. And, and, and you look at this, and you look at it, and this is what I want to ask you as a former Tory MP. It must be galling to know that the Labour Party, with the issues that they have and, and the unanswered questions about fundability, for it doesn't even exist, that word, but it sounded quite good. It Fun does now. Oh, it does now. Uh, fundability. <laughs> that the Tories seem to be in such disarray. And in fact, as I was saying earlier, people just aren't listening to them, that they're not getting to the point of being able to question the Labour Party and what it would mean if they get into power, because the whole world is centred on not just D-Day or Sky Television, just this party that's ripping itself to shreds. And that must be frustrating for traditional Tories, pal. Uh, it's a nightmare. Look, first of all, I think we've got a news section in the Jeremy Kyle show. Every uh, a five minute section called Fundability Watch. We test a <laughs> we test a Labour proposal on fundability. It doesn't exist it that one. I've made a right idiot of myself, is, haven't I? Is it, is it fundamentally fundabilitous? <laughs> but you're right. Look, uh, you're you're a candidate in a constituency. And you're part of a team. You're part of a team of 600 people, 300 of whom will roughly will get over the line. You are irrelevant. You are completely irrelevant, however much you pretend as a candidate. And I used to, I, pretend, I stood in a Labour seat the first time and I used to dream every night. I won't tell you quite what I'd know. I used to dream. There's a guy called Peter Snow who had this swingometer. Yes. Uh, which would show, uh, and he was the guy to watch on election night in the BBC. And I used to dream. I had this dream of the 97 election where he'd say, hold on, hold on, something extraordinary is happening in Bristol. We go live to Bristol against all the odds. You know, Ed Vasey has taken You got battered, seat. didn't you? You got battered. So you, you? you got battered. Yeah, yeah. So, so the only way you can get up in the morning is to convince yourself that you're going to win. Uh, but at the same time, you do know, your head knows, that 95% of the people going to the polls are voting either for Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer, broadly speaking. Uh, so it is very, very frustrating because you have no way of influencing that campaign. You are simply a boat bobbing on the tide of that campaign. And you probably are tearing your hair out. A lot of, a lot of constituency elections, by the way, are run in quite traditional ways, which is a good thing. So you have hustings. It's normally the church will organise a hustings. Do you miss it? And you sit with all your candidates and the Tory candidates will be desperate to say, well, then... You know, did you watch Jeremy Carl's fundability watch yesterday? They can't, they can't make it add up. They can't make it add up. 
But the people who come there, all of them have already made up their minds anyway, because they're the political activists. So there'll be the Labour activists, the Tory activists. Do you activists, miss it? Of do course you? I miss it. Do I, you? Of course I miss it. The campaign trail is a lot of fun. Um, it, Especially a, Hustings. Oh we've my got a God, new thing on this. You get it in the neck of the Hustings. Yeah, well, I, I get it in the neck of the day. We've got, a, we've got two new features, Fundability Watch, and also <laughs> we've got Voice Notes, which I didn't know about until Monday. Oh, yes. And Nikki... We have them on Times Radio. Did I mention I have a Times Radio show? Yeah, all right. Uh, Nikki is 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 on a, a voice note, and it's about you. Have a listen. Ed Vasey, one of the unelected bureaucrats, raking in three hundred and sixty pounds a day for just sewing his face. Oh, get rid of them all! Off with their heads! Don't have folk like this on your um, program, Jeremy. Well, I think that's particularly harsh. I thought it was going to be an... Oh, well, back to the gym. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. It's, it's 361, I think. <laughs> what do you... So now, so there's a lot of people who think that, poly, you know, that, that the House of Lords should be abolished. Your thoughts? Uh, Answering Nicky they're right. There? They're right. <laughs> so, I mean, look, the, the House of Lords is fundamentally undemocratic uh, and uh, on paper it's an absurd institution. The reason the House of Lords exists is nobody can think of a better alternative. There is rumours that Labour will bring in some reforms. They'll bring in a retirement age of 75, for example, which would reduce the numbers by about a third. They'll stop hereditary peers being elected. I know it sounds odd, but they are elected in a convoluted in, uh, manner. So they could certainly reduce the size of the House of Lords. But also, don't forget, there'll be a lot of Labour peers who do enjoy being the unelected bureaucrats uh, who will be talking in Keir Starmer's ears saying, you don't want to go too far, Keir. Um, what I'd like to ask you before you head off to another um, gin and tonic, and it's delightful to have you on, um, would you be happy to front a new feature every Wednesday called <laughs> Jezza's Fundability Watch? Yes, I would be delighted. Um, and you have a very good show is on it time. Fundable? Is it, is it is, fundable? Is it fundable? <laughs> Let's check out this policy for fundability with Ed Vasey Look on the at Jeremy Carl Show. Fundability meter. Good. Uh, yes, we're going to have a fundability it's swing on red. <laughs> it's swinging red. Uh, Edward Vasey, you're a legend. Thank you very much indeed. What a lovely man. There you are. You see, that's what happens, right, Ryan? The best ideas come up whilst you're on air. We're going to have a fundability swing on meter watch thing. Uh,